Do you completely control your actions? This may seem like an obvious question at first. Think it over, though. What did you eat for breakfast this morning? It probably wasn't a steak and mashed potatoes. Why not? Because it's not what most people think of as breakfast food. So who defines the term breakfast food? The public at large. And that's what prompted one man to spend his life perfecting the science of crystallizing public opinion. In December of 1912, an unemployed 20-year-old named Edward Louis Bernays was still trying to figure out what to do with his life. One cold morning in Manhattan, he bumped into an old friend on the 9th Avenue trolley. The man was Fred Robinson, owner of two low-profile medical journals called the Medical Review of Reviews and the Dietetic and Hygienic Gazette. He asked Eddie, how'd you like to help me run the Review and Gazette? Eddie, despite knowing little about medicine, accepted the job on the spot. The big break for the enterprising pair came when they partnered with an actor named Richard Bennett to produce a play called Damaged Goods. The plot revolved around a man with syphilis who married and had a child with the disease. The play violated early 20th century taboos on so many levels that few people ever thought it could be produced, but Eddie was determined to make it happen. He published articles in the Review and Gazette and formed a group he called the Sociological Fund Committee, dedicated to the worthiness of battling prudishness. It attracted such noteworthy members as John D. Rockefeller Jr., Franklin D. Roosevelt, and Dr. William J. Shiflin, inventor of the syphilis treatment. The play was an instant hit. Fred and Eddie immediately began thinking of other plays they could promote in the same way, about other social evils, like drugs or prostitution. But their strategizing was cut short by Richard Bennett, who had bought the rights to damaged goods. In a letter he told them, I don't need your damn sociological fund anymore. I own all the rights to damaged goods. Ta-ta. Eddie was too resilient a man to let a loss like that stop him, though. Having gotten his first taste of the job he was to spend the rest of his life pursuing, he didn't want to return to the slow job of editing medical magazines. Instead, he traveled to what is now the Czech Republic to visit his uncle Sigmund Freud. He spent his summer there learning about his uncle's theories about the subconscious. What Eddie got from Freud was indeed this idea that there is a lot more going on in human decision making. Not only among individuals, but even more importantly among groups. After Bernays returned to the U.S., he got back to work. He began promoting a Russian ballet company called the Ballet Russe. The major difficulty was that Americans had little respect for European culture and thought men had no business on the stage in tights. He began by writing a monograph mostly about the ballet itself and how it had influenced modern novelties and fashions. He used the pen name Aburn Edwards so people wouldn't recognize him as the same person who wrote a similar article for the magazine Vanity Fair. Bernays attempted to get the Ladies' Home Journal to run pictures of the ballet, but they wouldn't because they felt the dancer's skirts were too short. After he had a couple of painters add a little length to the skirts, two pages of colored photos reached millions of subscribers. Then there was the problem of building the reputation of the principal dancers. He tried calling a press conference, but only one newspaper showed up. So he took a picture of principal ballerina Flora Rivales at the Bronx Zoo with a python draped around her neck and urged her to make the snake a personal trademark. As he explained it later, Flore Rivales might well have had to wait years for national recognition. That snake took up a lot of lag time. During World War I, American tobacco scored victories as much as the Doughboys did. Before the war, men smoked pipes and cigars, but soon, cigarettes were found to be more convenient in the trenches, and were included in rations. None profited so much as George Washington Hill, head of the American Tobacco Company, which manufactured the leading brand of cigarettes in the world. But Hill, always one to leverage an opportunity, saw women as his next target, and he hired Edward Bernays to help him. As he told Bernays, it'll be like opening a gold mine in our front yard. Bernays started by promoting cigarettes as a diet aid with slogans like reach for a lucky instead of sweet, seeking endorsements from doctors and encouraging home economics experts to stress the importance of cigarettes and homemaking. The difficulty was that, in society's eyes, the morals of women who smoked were questionable, so Bernays staged an event that would change the way women were viewed forever. Men have invoked a taboo against women smoking in public. Can you do anything about that? I said, let me think about it. 
Bernays called a young women's rights activist he knew and sent her memos to pass out to her friends. He called for elite young women to march down Fifth Avenue on Easter Sunday in full view of church-going crowds and light torches of freedom. Along the route, they would be joined by women from various other churches. In all, ten women challenged gender roles by smoking their cigarettes in the Gala Easter Parade. The newspapers had been contacted beforehand, and the story spread like wildfire. Soon, women all over the country were sporting their own torches of freedom. He knew this would be an outcry, and he knew that all of the photographers would be there to capture this moment. And so he was ready with a phrase, which was, torches of freedom. Probably the most ambitious campaign Bernays masterminded was the one that made green fashionable. Nowadays, few people in public relations would try it, and even fewer would know how. But Edward Bernays defined the profession. He invented the science of ballyhoo. Why would he even attempt it, though? Because his employer, George Hill, CEO of American Tobacco, had just spent millions of dollars to advertise the Lucky Strike package and vehemently refused to change it. However, since the growing female market thought the green package clashed with their outfits, it was up to Bernays to make green the in color. Bernays used what he called Big Think. It was his own style, roundabout way of changing, not the image of a product, but the population's conscious and subconscious desires for it. He asked shopkeepers to make green window displays and got French fashion designers to make green clothes. He went so far as to convince a doctor to publish an essay saying green vegetables were good for you. Soon everyone got into the green craze while Bernays put the icing on the cake, an event he called the green ball. Naturally, the dresses were green, the decorations were green, and all the proceeds went to charity. The elite of society were invited. Suddenly, green was all the rage and Lucky Strike sales went through the roof. In 1923, Bernays published the first book ever written on the how-to of propaganda titled Crystallizing Public Opinion, a pioneer work which has become a classic and is still widely used in the field of public relations today. The public had come a long way in such a short time. Just a little under four decades earlier, the railroad magnate William Henry Vanderbilt had famously told a reporter, the public be damned. Now Edward Bernays was proving that modifying the opinion of the public was a success story waiting to happen if for any company who cared to hire him, causing him to be in high demand. He raised his fees because of the demand, and also because he believed that people wouldn't take his advice unless they paid more for it. And, as he pointed out, he was no miracle worker. As he said often, people go where they want to be led. In the mid-1920s, Beechnut Packing Company, a huge bacon producer, hired Bernays to increase their slumping bacon sales. The most common tactic of the day would have been to attack the other bacon companies, but Bernays saw things a bit differently. He found that Americans ate less for breakfast because they were in a hurry in the morning. So he convinced a doctor he knew in New York to write the colleagues to see if they endorsed a light or a hearty breakfast. Hardy won a landslide victory, the word spread through the media, and Americans followed the advice. Bernays promoted bacon and eggs as the best way to start your day, and the modern American breakfast was born. The after effects of the campaign are still felt today. In 1933, prohibition was repealed, but many communities were sympathetic to temperance, and dry communities began cropping up everywhere. So in 1935, beer brewers hired Bernays. Eddie promoted beer as a beverage of moderation and as a temperance aid, telling people that they could drink beer if they had an urge for alcohol and thus avoid hard liquor. A sort of vaccination against intemperance, he said. He told farmers that brewers were a major buyer of their barley, corn, and rice, and told laborers that beer was a beverage they could afford. He wrote that beer was the favorite drink of the Babylonians, monks of the Middle Ages, George Washington, and the Pilgrims. Some temperance workers began to believe that the best way to fight intemperance was to legalize the sale of beer everywhere. France may like its wine and Russia its vodka, but Bernays made sure that modern Americans' beverage of choice is beer. Over the years, Bernays worked for an impressive list of clients, including General Electric, General Motors, the New York Philharmonic, and President Calvin Coolidge. He helped out the Aluminum Company of America by pushing the dental benefits of a potentially hazardous byproduct of aluminum called fluoride, even getting it added to drinking water. He helped Dixie Cups become commonplace as he worked to promote them as a solution to the growing problem of public hygiene. Bernays paved the way for modern American consumerism and may have been the most important man ever to help companies make you buy what you don't need.